Welcome to the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast. This is Dr. Yvette Martinez Vu, and I will be serving as your Femme Tour, providing you with tips and tricks and everything else you need to know to get into graduate school. For the past 10 years, I've been helping undergraduate students get into top graduate programs in their field, and I'm really excited to share this information with you too. Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy and excited. Uh, today, we have a special guest, someone who um, is a former UCSB McNair scholar and alum. Um, she's here. She's going to be talking about the topic of ethical chisme and the harsh realities of grad school. Oh, this is such a, a strong topic. I'm so excited for you to get into this. Uh, but before you do, I'm going to uh, share her bio so you know who she is. Um, our speaker today is Sirenia Sanchez. She is a third year PhD candidate in the social psychology doctor program at Northwestern. She received her BA in psychology and communication from University of California, Santa Barbara, where, like I said earlier, she was a McNair scholar. That's how we know each other. Her current research uh, focuses on the psychological effects of cultural appropriation and the racial and gender differences found in how people perceive risk. Outside of the lab, however, Sirenia serves as a diversity and inclusion fellow for Northwestern's graduate school, and she's also a social media chair for Comunidad Latinx, a group of Latinx graduate students. So welcome, welcome, Sirenia. Um, yeah, we'll get started with just the first question. If you can tell us a little bit more about yourself, about your background, about just like kind of how you got to graduate school and the field of social psych. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Yvette. Like, it's, it's really exciting to be in this space. Um, so yeah, I, my name is Sirenia. I am from Southern California, specifically the Inland Empire. I'm a first-gen college student. Um, and so like Yvette mentioned, I went to UC Santa Barbara and I was in the McNair Scholars Program. While I was in the program, I also went to a summer research program at Northwestern, which is really what got my start into grad school and what convinced me to, to leave California and go to Chicago. Um, and so since then, I've been focusing my research um, on social, social psychology because I'm really interested in racial and ethnic identities and how we, as people of color, maneuver ourselves in this world, in this country. Uh, so in particular, I'm interested in culture appropriation because that affects how we feel and how we feel accepted by our peers who engage in appropriation. So a lot of my work tries to center um, the impacts uh, we experience as people of color. Um, and so, yeah, I've been in grad school for about three years and wow. I'm <laughs> I know it's crazy. I never thought I'd be in this position um, and I'm still trying to find ways to, to survive and still learn what it's like to be in academic spaces like grad school. It's, you know, grad school is hard for everyone. Um, so it's, it's not a surprise that we're talking about that we have this topic today. So I wanted you to kind of tell us a little bit about um, why you were interested in talking about ethical chisme. I'm actually like less familiar with the phrase. So I was hoping that you could define the term, you know, ethical chisme, uh, you know, how, how do you define it? And then let us know, like, so what does that have to do with grad school and with those challenges, the harsh realities that we've been referring to? Absolutely. I, I definitely want to preface that the term ethical chisme was something that I learned um, and heard from on a podcast called Locatora Radio. Uh, so in my first year of grad school, it was my first time living completely alone in an apartment. I was used to living with so many people, either back home or on, in college. And so I really needed like the apartment to be filled with voices and people. And so I was listening to this podcast, Locatora Radio, and they had an interview with queer Chicano chisme, I think they go by Ruben, and they discussed um, ethical chisme. Uh, the episode's called Para Luchar Hay Que Chismear. So definitely like wow. listen, definitely listen to that. It's it opened my mind and really let me um, reconsider what chisme really is and remove the negative connotation of being called a chismosa um, because there's there's a lot of power um, in you know, engaging in chisme. And so the way I reflect on that episode uh, is that ethical chisme is used um, for spreading information to, pro to protect uh, marginalized people, survivors, 
um, those who are on the lower end of power dynamics, it's really used to spread information um, in the hopes of protecting others. And so um, that's kind of how I have approached ethical chisme and distinguishing being chismosa and a Medici. And that's something in the podcast that they oh. share that uh, chismosa is involving, you know, talking about a topic that's relevant to them and their safety. Whereas Medici is like you're just getting into somebody else's business that has nothing to do with you and is not relevant to you. Um, and so it's really eye opening um, to really like break away from these negative words and really understanding the distinction um, that being a chismosa could be really helpful, uh, especially in spaces in which you feel threatened in a new space. Um, and I think that's what grad school kind of is, is just this very new space, especially for first gen students of color, um, how to maneuver that space and how do you know about what to do, who to work with, who to take a class with. It's all through, in a way, ethical chisme, just chisme, like you hear from other students. Um, if a professor has engaged in inappropriate behavior, has said racist or insensitive stuff, the only way that's really communicated, it's never going to be communicated in uh, the, the course description. Um, the faculty will not say that to you. You depend on other students to be like, hey, like, don't take this class. This guy or this person is just really not a good instructor to be around. And that's the kind of stuff I've been trying to engage in now that I'm a third year and I try to be there for younger students because we do have problematic faculty at Northwestern and every every department anywhere yeah has problematic yes. uh, faculty and so uh, and that's something I didn't realize was like how how personal academia can be um, how much personalities can really dominate a classroom or a relationship um, and so I've tried to reach out to first year students and give them a heads up of who to trust and who not to trust, uh, especially reaching out to students of color um, who are entering this very white space and just giving them the lowdown of like, you know, this experience is something that I experienced with this person. Um, and I just wanna give you the heads up so you can prepare as you enter a relationship with that faculty or advisor. Uh, because that's something I wish happened to me when I started grad school. There was there's a problematic faculty who taught a stats class that all first year students had to take. Um, and I didn't realize that he would use um, transphobic and racist examples in the class. And that really distracted me from learning. Um, and so I wish I knew, I wish someone had my back and gave me the, the 411 of like, this is what you're gonna expect in this class. Um, and I try to do that with first years that are in my program and tell them like, hey, like this is a mandatory class you have to take with this professor um, and they will bring up insensitive topics, but do your best to try to focus on the, on the learning objectives and try to separate the, the things you're learning in class from the person um, because that was really hard for me to do because I was so blindsided by how this could be a thing. And so I think engaging in ethical chisme really helps prepare first gen graduate students, really helps prepare students of color um, to exceed and not get distracted by problematic people in their department. Um, it can also save a lot of time of also thinking like, is this just me? Am I the only person who sees this? Am I the only person who's catching uh, this remark that's racist, transphobic, homophobic, et cetera? Um, so, I, so I also think being open and developing trust with other grad students so you guys can share like um, your perceptions and what you see because sometimes it can feel like you're the only one seeing things, but you can develop a sense of camaraderie and solidarity when you come together and kind of talk about, hey, like, did you see what happened in class? And then together you can kind of, you know, reflect on the process and not feel alone. Um, and so that's kind of a brief uh, introduction of how I engage in ethical chisme in graduate school to protect myself and to protect others uh, because a lot of academia, academia is still, uh, in the hands of older white straight cis men who don't realize what they're saying can be really hurtful 
and, and perpetrate a lot of issues. Wow. Um, you know, this is a really good teaching moment, not just for the listeners, but also for me, because I'm not going to lie, I have associated cheesemen with that negative connotation as like, when I was in grad school, I would say, oh, like, try to like avoid um, in uh, like intra department politics and try to like avoid the gossip. And so even among like my own circle of friends, my circle of friends were other women of color in different departments, because then we would avoid talking about our the politics of our own departments and having like the word spread. And so I was always like very careful with like who I shared what with. Mm -hmm. And so in, in many ways, I think I had this negative association, but I was, I was myself exercising that, the ethical cheese maybe because when people reached out to me, I always would talk to them and I would say, actually, you want to avoid someone. So mm -hmm. they're very toxic and I worked with them. It was not, it was not positive. Like, you know, they're racist, they're sexist, they're this, they're that. Um, but it's just, it's, it's a really good teachable moment. And I'm, I'm wondering, because you said, you mentioned more than once, like, I wish someone would have told me about this. I wish I wouldn't have, or in, in some ways, like you wish you would have avoided being blindsided and sound like strategically, what can you do? Because I tell the students, our current McNair scholars all the time, like before you apply, talk to the professors, and talk to the grad students and talking to the grad students is just as important if not more important than talking to the professors and i'm like talk to them talk to them talk to them sometimes they listen sometimes they don't and i really wish that they they did listen because i'm like Ooh, the grad students are going to tell a lot of them not everybody but a lot of them like will be compelled to tell you the truth um so strategically like what would you say to students who are trying to protect themselves and who don't who like you like don't want to be blindsided and want to be able to like they still want to go to grad school and navigate it but they want to be able to like avoid you know <laughs> avoid toxicity as much as yeah. possible <laughs> yeah I, I think one thing too is to also clarify that you can have a toxic relationship with an advisor uh, or somebody that you work with and that's sometimes a reality that isn't talked about in undergrad because we think professionalism would entail like uh, you know peaceful um, an equal relationship but grad school can can become really personal um, and so also to just emphasize that it's important to know who you're working with and obviously the way to go about it is not asking the faculty themselves like oh are you toxic uh but absolutely like grad students i always recommend undergrads to reach out to grad students first um it also helps you gauge how available the faculty is if the faculty is willing to speak with you and grad students can vouch for you as an undergrad and put you in contact with the faculty but yeah, like grad students will be there or should be there to tell you like, honestly, like it, what the reality is to work with a certain person. Um, so that's also my strategy is to do that um, during interview weekends, ask um, how it is to work with an advisor. How has an advisor approached um, this agreement between the student um, and themselves? I think that could be really helpful. Um, I think the biggest thing is, is reaching out to grad students um, you can do this via email. Academic Twitter is a thing. Um, it's seemed to be really growing. And so the Emming grad students that are in the labs or in the programs you're interested in would be really helpful. Um, and sometimes like it's it's just a matter of, of just being in grad school and then developing and identifying older grad students who you can trust. Because like you said, you that like we engage in these things in this cheese man with people who we trust. It's a selective process. I think with a Metiche, that's like they're good. Just, that's a good distinction. Yes. Yes, yes. Like with a Metiche, like they're the ones just they don't care who knows. They don't care how it impacts somebody. But like with with the ethical cheese man, like you're you have a selective process of who will trust you and who will trust your judgment. Um, and we'll trust your intentions because I think with ethical achievement, it comes with good intentions to protect um, and to advise someone of something pro like problematic or troublesome that may happen. Um, and so for any incoming grad students, identify that person that you can trust. Um, gauge if they're willing to talk about the realities of grad school because a lot of us have experienced inappropriate or uncomfortable situations and so I think that would be the most important part 
is identifying somebody um, or getting in contact with another student of color in the program. That's what I did when I went to Northwestern um, the summer after my junior year. There was, there was a lot of white people in the space and there was one black uh, student in the lab um, and I reached out to her and I was like, hey, like, what is your experience as a woman of color in this space? And she gave me the lowdown. She gave me the cheese of what it was like to be a, a woman of color at Northwestern in the Department of Psychology. And I appreciated that. Um, and so I identified her as someone I can trust and someone who has trusted me with the information to protect me um, as I was getting into Northwestern. Um, and so I think that would be the biggest strategy is just identifying other students of color or other students who, who share similar identities that are important to you and seeing how they feel in that space. Um, and just asking a broad question of what is something you wish you knew about working with so-and-so, um, being in a class with so-and-so. Um, I think just really identifying uh, people who you trust um, because they'll be the ones to have your back and to hear you out when you do experience um, inappropriate or uncomfortable situations. So I would say, I would say that grad students and just identifying, um, yeah, the group who you can trust. You know, um, as I'm hearing you speak about this, I, I can see how, you know, you're saying trust is a really big, big um, thing with exercising ethical chisme because they, you know, the individual has to feel like, like that they trust you, trust your judgment and vice versa. You need to feel that you trust them and that the word isn't going to spread, you know? And so that's the part of it that um, I'm always curious about because in sharing and disclosing information, you're also being vulnerable and putting yourself at risk in some way, shape or form. And I've heard of folks who, who have opted, even in my own department when I was a grad student, who opted not to say anything or who like took the side of the faculty and just wanted to make sure that, that they were in like in good terms with all the faculty of the department. And so they did not share that information. So if you did go to them, they were just just talk about the logistics of the program, but they, they just didn't share anything negative, um, even though we knew that there were <laughs> some people you wanted to avoid and some things that were happening that were not okay. So I'm curious, like, how do you navigate that aspect of it, of like, you have good intentions, you wanna protect someone, um, and there's, there's always that risk. Some folks choose not to take that risk and some of us choose to take that risk. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. I think it, it's something that I'm still maneuvering of like, who do I trust to understand my intentions when I try to give them the heads up? Um, it's really difficult because there's so, there's so much power dynamics and politics in graduate school uh, because we're grad students are in a lower position of power. An advisor can just not work with us, can, can take away our funding could refuse to give us feedback on work, um, give us bad reviews. There's, there's multiple ways in which we can rub faculty the wrong way. And if it gets eventually to them, it could be really difficult. Um, and I think with establishing trust and identifying who, who to talk to about these things, I think there's also the element of respecting somebody's silence or somebody's just decision not to disclose because these things are really difficult to maneuver. Ethical chisme is not a, a, a common topic in grad school. And that's something I wanna try to like invite other grad students to, to not just share the accomplishments and the great things that we've done in our research, but to engage in, in the ways in which we've struggled and the ways in which we've encountered something uncomfortable with somebody um, and really trying to normalize a culture in which we're transparent I think that's the ultimate goal is to be transparent because there, there's just hidden norms and curriculums in grad school where like we, we don't know what's normal. We don't know what it's like to move over this space. Um, and so because of that, like it, it's hard to it's hard to it is hard to identify someone who will be open and receptive. Um, and sometimes people just have reasons to fear, to be scared, to open up. And I think it's just best to respect it. If you feel like someone's not engaging or is uncomfortable, then to, then to not share that information with that person. Um, because it, this is a really difficult space to maneuver and you don't want to force somebody um, to disclose personal information that can sometimes, can sometimes feel embarrassing or shameful. Um, so I think it's, it's just moving on 
um, and finding other spaces that could be a, a therapist even, um, other students from a different department or program. So often joining clubs, student organizations where like you don't feel like what you're gonna share is gonna get around to somewhere else, but maybe that person can still take your advice um, even if it doesn't apply to the same program. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really difficult space to be in um, because there can be repercussions um, that, that, are, that are really damaging. Yeah, that's a part of it that I feel like it's so risky is, is the repercussions. It's like, what if the word, what you share about an individual goes and gets, you know, spread to that person themselves. And, and that's a part of it that's like, I'm like, everybody has to be very careful with what they decide to do and who they decide to share with um, because of that power dynamic that you pointed out. That power dynamic is, it's, it exists, you can't hide it. Even if a professor tries to act like, you know, some, some professors are great and they are um, really good advocates and they're good people. Like, they, you know, those are the professors you want there. But despite as much as they want to <laughs> be good people, there's still that hierarchy and they still have a lot of power over you. And they can still, like you said, take away your funding, not, you know, uh, impose hurdles that will prevent you from graduating. Um, it's just, it's really scary um, that which which was why like I think I like I was saying when I was in grad school I did exercise ethical achievement but I was very very um, selective mm -hmm. with who I talked to and it was often just like with people I was very close to or folks that like right away when we started talking to we developed a good rapport like mm -hmm. uh, even if they were new people that were coming in I was like oh I can tell I I, I don't mm -hmm. know what it is it's about intuition there's that mm -hmm. feeling in my gut of like oh you're cool <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even yeah. have, know how to describe yeah. that but there's just yeah. that feeling when you're like okay you're cool I can trust you mm -hmm. I don't know what it is about that feeling and then there are other folks that I just didn't get that feeling <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Mm, I'm gonna be I'm gonna like tread waters carefully <laughs> mm -hmm. and most Absolutely. of the time it didn't fail me so it's just interesting that you're talking about that because I'm like there's something about it about being very not just going off and talking to anybody and not just going off and being a metiche and trying to find out about other people's business. It's not about other people's business. It's about safety and protection. Exactly. Yeah. And it's usually centered around informing students about faculty. And it's not about just like speaking ill of other people, just, just to say it. Like it's, it's really about like how someone of a higher authority can be in some ways really toxic and just to give the heads up. And also it's good to be just clear that this is like not slandering, um, that this is not like speak, just, you know, giving adjectives, negative adjectives of the person, but just being concrete of like, this person has done this to this person or to me. And I feel like that's something that's relevant to you and you should know in case you encounter this. And telling students like you can come to me if this is what you're going through, so you're not alone. Um, and just being really clear of, of making these more about actions um, and also providing that safe space for if something repeats, um, that there's a space for those students to go to um, and that it's okay to talk about these issues and not be silently on their own, reflecting and thinking that they have done something wrong when it's sometimes just the faculty or the person in power um, who's engaging in something toxic. Do you feel like it's it's always about something really like like a, a big thing like oh this person is known to be racist and sexist or this person is known to discriminate in this way or can it also be about because I know like sometimes it's like oh I kind of want to tell you my department doesn't really offer funding I kind of want to tell you we don't have a lot of resources or like there's things that are about that are not even about an individual per se, but about the department, the culture, the space, you know, like that, or maybe like, mm, you like hands-on, this person's very hands-off. Yeah. And it's not just like, I ha there's nothing wrong with that person. They're great, but they're just, that's their style. So um, I can imagine that can all be part of that conversation too. Yeah, 100% agree. I, I think uh, this expands to just like neutral things or just like information of like, well, when my advisor gives feedback, they can be pretty blunt. So just, it's nothing about you. They're just a really straight to the, 
straight to the point person. And that's an, that's information. That's like intel that would help inform somebody if that's a relationship that they want to have with an advisor that does that. So 100%, like I try to give advice about you know, who is hands-on, who is hands-off, who is who expects more independence from a grad student and who who doesn't. So I think absolutely, I think that's a big part of ethical achievement is just to inform, um, inform people of the things that aren't obvious, the things that aren't um, embedded in the cultural norm of grad school. And so it doesn't have to be about, yeah, it could be the extreme things. Ideally, hopefully those are minimal. Um, but it is about just like informing, like, is this the best, best fit for you? Um, sometimes that, that, that makes the biggest difference too, is just like a, a good advisor, advisee relationship fit and really asking those questions. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. Um, even sharing the things that are like, uh, like, no, like maybe minimal funding or the problems with like money in grad school, like that in itself too. Um, anything that's done to protect and to inform people who might be in vulnerable positions in the future, I think all would be considered into ethical achievement um, and really just being transparent about what it's like to be in grad school. I love that. I guess I've been exercising that all along without knowing. <laughs> yeah. no, same, same. I'm like, once I heard that podcast, I was like, yeah. that's what I did in my junior year mm -hmm. at Northwestern. I wanted that cheese man, I wanted that insight. Um, and so, yeah, that's just something that we all do is to protect each other um, and to look out for one another because these spaces can really make us feel that we don't belong or that we're the only ones seeing something wrong in the space. So yeah, I think a lot of us do this already. And I think just thinking of it as ethical cheese can really help, uh, you know, continue this, this motivation that we all have. Yeah, it's helpful to have um, to reframe it in the mm -hmm. way that, that you're saying. Um, so we're going to get ready to wrap up. And I have um, just another question because um, we've been talking about stuff that's, you know, not not always fun to talk about. You know, it's like the challenges, the difficulties, um, the things that you want to watch out for in grad school. But I'm like, well, you're still a grad student. I still got my PhD. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> what motivates you to keep going or like what advice would you give to others who are on this path and who know that there will be challenges and who are still you know are, are still gonna you know are still motivated to pursue graduate school so what what keeps you going yeah I definitely think it's it's other students of color in academia it really is just other people like us um, who, who exceed and who do well and create community. Like that's honestly been the biggest thing for me is knowing that like, if something goes wrong, if I'm uncomfortable, if I'm not happy with a certain situation, I have a community to rely on. I have folks who understand me, folks who will listen to me and respect and like validate my feelings. I think that's the biggest part because we will struggle. We will have disagreements with our advisors. We will have disagreements with our department's choices. Um, we will always want better for ourselves and for others. And so just having a space to talk about it and to know that you're not alone, I think has been the biggest motivator for me um, is that this is not like, this is not a space in which, you know, I, I'm left to struggle by myself. Like there's a community here. Um, I'm also just really happy with like how, how much opportunities there are to connect with students at Northwestern in particular. Um, and so I think that's been the biggest motivator. And I would suggest for grad students who are just starting is to, to find your community, find your people, even if your department is so white or whatever, like, you know, reach out to different departments, reach out to different student orgs, really try to get involved um, and try to look out for other incoming students as you get older. I think that's a way of also developing community is you initiating and creating that safe space um, for students. And so I think just being aware that, you know, trouble can come in grad school and not be blindsided and be aware that there are politics and there's big personalities, problematic personalities, um, and that academia is not an objective space. It, it's really subjective. Um, and so to just, I think the first step is to realize that and then to develop a community so you can cope 
and laugh about it too, right? Like sometimes it's just fun to just laugh at, at the, the struggles that we go through because sometimes it can be often and sometimes just be ridiculous. Um, so I think that's what would be my biggest suggestions for students going into grad school. I like that you mentioned community. I know a lot of folks will like stress, oh, networking is important in grad school, but um, I've always tried to focus more on community building and, and establishing support systems. And I can actually vouch that in grad school, I made some of my lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. um, same even in undergrad, like from, I did the Mellon Mace program kind of like McNair. And I've got a couple of folks who like, I'm like from that program and from grad school, they're like my ride or dies, they're my lifelong friends, they're people that got my back and have vouched for me. And I, I, I feel like um, that's probably true for you. You've probably met some folks that you know, like these folks are gonna be around mm -hmm. in my life for a long time, if not for most of your life. So that's kind of nice is like, no matter what happens on your path, if you you know if you establish that community and that support system you've got folks who are going to be there for you no matter what yeah mm -hmm. definitely well now that we're wrapping up um if anybody wanted to reach out to you or if someone was just like oh wow i'd really like to connect a little bit more I, I i resonated so much with what you said um is there any way for them to reach out to you or um do you have like an academic twitter or something that yeah. <laughs> i could share with them <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah, no, you can find me on my academic Twitter. My handle is Sirenia underscore SV. So that's S-I-R-E-N-I-A underscore SV. Feel free to DM me. Um, my, if you just Google my name, Sirenia Sanchez Northwestern, I'll probably show up on Google, but you can probably just find me on Twitter. Um, and I'm super happy to discuss more about this topic, more about grad school. Um, it's, it's a complicated space to be in, but it, it's still a space that I encourage folks to go to, especially if they have the tools to do so. And so it's all possible. Um, and I just want to be sure everyone has the right resources um, to, to succeed. Thank you so much, Sirenia. Appreciate it. It's been so okay. nice. Yes, thank you so much, Yvette. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks so much for joining me in the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please rate this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or anywhere you tune in. You can also support the podcast by donating to my Patreon page, Anchor page, or Venmo account, which is at Grad School Fem Touring. If you have questions or episode topics, you can contact me by sending me a DM on Instagram sending me an email to gradschoolfemtouring at gmail.com, sending me a voice message on Anchor, or sending me a message via my personal website at yvettemartinezvu.com. Until next time.